adversity and persecution and challenges in their life. And so he's really concerned about how you're doing. Because they had to leave. We'll see this as we go through the text. But they had to leave. But many people have adversity. It may be financial adversity you have in your life. You know, it could be family adversity that you have in your life. It could be, your, it could be situations with your job. Right? You can have adversity on the job. Can you have that? I mean, various challenges dealing with people or dealing with what's taking place within your job environment. What about physically? Can you have adversity physically in your life? No doubt about it. You can have disease and illness and many things that you and I can have concerning adversity in our lives. And, you know, one thing we know is this. Because we live in a fallen world and because we live in the midst of sinful people, My friend, I can just tell you, we're going to have challenges. Am I right? I mean, we're not in heaven yet. I'd like to be in heaven, but we're not there yet. And because we're in a fallen world, in the midst of people who make really poor decisions in life, that sometimes affect your life and affect my life, we have adversity. We have to deal with very difficult situations. You know, adversity, hardships, however you want to call that, situations which really get you down. By the way, can a Christian get down in their life? Can they? Absolutely. Well, here's what we know about Paul, Silas, and Timothy. They went to Thessalonica. They preached the Word of God. There are many, listen to me, many came to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. But it wasn't but a short time where the Jewish leadership got upset, really became envious and jealous because so many people were coming to faith in Christ. And so they got upset. They stirred up other people emotionally. And by the way, we have a lot of emotions being stirred up in our nation today, do we not? Well, we have a lot of, they had a lot of emotions being stirred up. They usually, or they eventually went to the authorities trying to deal with the situation. So that's kind of the backdrop of what we're dealing with here in chapter 3. So I know you've been standing, sitting, standing, but we believe the Bible is the inspired, the infallible Word of God. And honor the reading of the Word of God with me. Would you just please stand? And I'm going to read this. And then you can sit down for the next two and a half hours. No, no, just no. <laughs> Let's hope not, no. Notice it says, Therefore, when we could bear it no longer. You know what he's saying? He says, I need to know how you are. This church was under a lot of persecution. He could bear it no longer. He had a heaviness. He, had, he was concerned and worried about this church. Wait a minute. Didn't Paul say, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer, with supplication and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God? But notice, he's human. He says, I could bear it no longer. Notice, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone. That is, I'm, I'm be- he needed somebody there, but he says, you know what? I'm so concerned about you. And we sent Timothy, our brother, and God's co-worker of the gospel of Christ, to establish, exhort you in your faith, that no one be moved by the affliction. Notice, for yourselves know that you were destined for this thing. For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand, notice that we were, that we were to suffer affliction. Notice, he goes on to say, He says, affliction, just as it came to pass, as it has come to pass, and just as you know, for this reason I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your, what does he say? Notice, for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and your labor would be in vain. May the Lord bless the reading and preaching of His Word. You may be seated this morning, though I had. We're going to go through some of these other verses in just a little bit. So, you know, I wish I, I, wish I could say you and I are never going to have adversity in our life. Uh, but you know that's not true. I mean, many of you have gone through things I never want to walk through in my life. And I just admire you that you still have faith. You're hanging in there. You're stable in your faith in Christ. But I wish we had no adversity to go through, but I do know this. We do live in a fallen world, and I've I've experienced some challenges in my life. Pam and I have, personally. And uh, we know this thing thing takes place because we're in a fallen world, a sinful world, and in a world where many people make decisions 
You know, we believe in the freedom of the will that God gives us, but sometimes people make some very bad decisions. So I want to share several thoughts this morning related to this. Number one, you should have an outline in your bulletin. Notice number one, facing adversity can shake your faith. It can shake your faith. I want to remind you again that Paul was very successful. I mean, he and Timothy and Silas went there to Thessalonica and Man, it says they received the Word of God. But with just a very short, brief time, persecution came their way. And as a result of that, they had to leave. We know this. Let me just kind of share a passage there. And this is in Acts chapter 17. This is when they first went there. Notice. Now, when we had passed through Amphibolus and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, and there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as the custom was, went to them. Notice that for three Sabbaths, he reasoned with them from the Scriptures. That is, notice, explaining, demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer to rise again from the dead, saying, this Jesus, whom I preach to you, is the Christ. So he goes there. They need to hear the message. Well, notice, and some of them were persuaded in a great multitude of the devout Greeks. Did you know that I'm a quarter Greek, by the way. <laughs> I'm a quarter Greek. My, uh, my grandfather was full-blooded Greek, and, uh, but I'm a, I'm a quarter Greek. So here we have the Greeks, devout Greeks, not a few of the leading women. Notice some very outstanding women here in the community. Join Paul and Silas. But the Jews who were not persuaded became, what does it say? Envious took some of the evil men from the marketplace, gathering a mob set the city up in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason, sought to bring them out to the people. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason. He was kind of watching after them. And some of the brethren to the rulers. And notice what it goes on to say here. Of the city crying, these who have turned the world upside down have come here also. By the way, wouldn't it be wonderful if this church would turn this city upside down for the Lord Jesus Christ? By the way, this is Pentecost Sunday. Wouldn't it be wonderful if the Holy Spirit fell on us anew and afresh today? Man, we need a move of the Spirit of God in our midst today. And a rare church who believes in the presence and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit of God. I'm just so glad we are in a church family that allows for the Spirit of God to move in our midst. But it goes on, it says, Jason, verse 7, has harbored them, and these are acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar. Oh, why would they be concerned about the decrees of Caesar being Jews? Trying to start an issue here. By the way, isn't that the way the enemy works? It says, again, and they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city. And when they heard these things, it says, so when they had taken security from Jason, Jason, that is undoubtedly a little bit of money, and the rest, they let them go. Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, and when they had, had arrived there, they went to the synagogue of the Jews. So, so notice again what is happening here. They, Paul is very concerned about these brand new believers that he says, I've got to send Timothy back. We don't know chronologically when he did this, but we do know this. Eventually, he says, I am concerned because he knew, listen to me, he knew adversity can shake your faith. Have you ever had your faith shaken. I mean, have you ever had that experience? I'm sure some of you have. And when it happens, you start asking, wait a minute, God, why is this happening to me? Or Lord, I thought you were so loving and kind and gracious and merciful, and I thought that I'm your child, that you love me. Why is this happening to me? And Lord, why have you allowed this situation with my family, my children, this, that? Why is this going on? If you're sovereign, if you're all-powerful, if you say you could stop this, why is this going on in my life? Guys, I want you to know that, I don't know if you've ever asked those questions, but I can tell you your pastor has. Your pastor has. You know, Pam and I, I'm sure she's had the same questions, though, but I've, I've had these, and I cried out to the Lord, pleading weeping to God, saying, God, I don't understand it. And I'll tell you what, for a few weeks, it shook my faith to the core. As a matter of fact, there are three Sundays I could not preach. 
And I came back on a Wednesday night. And on that Wednesday night that I came back, I bowed my head to pray and I started sobbing. Couldn't even hardly get a word out, just started sobbing. But in the midst of it all, guess who was there? My Lord and my God, the presence of the Holy Spirit. And he got me through it. So, But I'm just simply saying, Paul is concerned. Here's the point. Paul was very concerned that the adversity and the challenges and the difficulty they were going through in their life was going to shake their faith. And so I'm just trying to encourage you to understand that it can happen in your life. It happened in my life. And it can happen in many different people's lives. We, we ask questions. So I want to say don't feel any shame or guilt if your faith is temporarily shaken. I mean, think about it. I'm the, I'm the pastor of the church. <laughs> you know, I was, I've been preaching this truth for many years in my life. I mean, here I am, the preacher, but yet my shake, faith, that is, is, is being shaken. Guys, it can happen to anybody when we go through adversity in life. I don't care who you are, how long you've walked with the Lord. You know, I finally got to the place, though, that little period. You know, preacher, you better start, you need to start believing what you're preaching. <laughs> <laughs> now, I always did. I always did. But it came down to where the rubber meets the road. Do you understand what I'm saying? What I'm saying this morning? What I'm saying is hey, if what I have been preaching is true, buddy, I need to re- relive my faith and think about my faith. And that's what I did. But, but don't feel any shame or guilt because sometimes your faith is shaken. Also, know that you're not alone. No, you're not alone. How many of you know that Jesus is above you, under you, on the side of you, in front of you, behind you? Amen. He's, he's everywhere you are. You're not alone. His presence will be with you in the midst of adversity. I guarantee you that. He's going to be there. I love this psalm. Notice, matter of fact, part of this psalm we sung this morning. Now, you didn't know I was going to give this scripture, but here it is. I will lift up my eyes. I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence cometh my help? My help comes from the Lord who made the heaven and the earth. You know what I like to say every time I think about that, reading that? My help come, comes from the Lord. By the way, you know the one who created everything you see on this planet, the heavens and the earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. That was what we were singing. Behold, he who keeps Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is the shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will preserve you from all evil. He will preserve your soul. The Lord, what shall he do? He shall preserve your going out, your coming forth from this time forth. Even what does he say? Forever. Woo, son, forevermore. <laughs> that is the word of God. That is the promise we have from the word of God. And, but another thing I just want to say is remember that Many of those that God has used in some of the most significant ways for his kingdom have gone through adversity. Now, let me just kind of mention a few of these guys. Abraham, did he have any adversity in his life? Moses, yeah, a little adversity in his life. What about Daniel? Well, what about the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ? What about Jesus himself? Did he not have adversity in his life? You know, Peter and James wrote about adversity and trials and difficult times in our life. Peter writes this, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by the fire, may be found to the praise, to the honor, to the glory of at the revelation that is at the coming, the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then James says this, my brethren. Now, I'm going to tell you, I'm not here spiritually yet. (laughs) I'm not quite here yet spiritually. But he says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces, what does it say? But let your patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So, here's what I'm saying. Adversity. I mean, how do we respond? 
We're either going to retreat from God or we're going to run to God. Am I right about that? That's what you're going to do when you have adversity in your life. Listen to this before I move to point two. I'm going to quote somebody. I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed. I failed over and over and over again in my life. And that is why I succeed. Michael Jordan. Whoa. John Maxwell, great pastor, does leadership conferences. Anything you read from him is great. He wrote a book. Let me tell you the title of his book. Falling Forward. Subtitle, Turn Your Mistakes into Stepping Stones for Success. <laughs> Let me just read one last verse before I go to point two. Genesis 50 says this. Remember Joseph had a few problems, did he? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Joseph, by the way, he had, a, he had a lot of problems after he had all these promises from God in his life. At the very end, you know the story. The Bible says, as Joseph said, do not be afraid, for I am, am I in the place of God? But as for me, you meant it for evil against me. But what does it say? Here's what I'm trying to tell you. God works things out in your life. Either we believe it or not, all things work together for good. It doesn't say everything is good in your life, but listen to me. Everything works together for the good to those who love God. And so, my dear friends, I don't understand a lot that happens in life but I'm trusting in a good, good Father. What about you this morning? Number two, facing adversity is the calling of the believer. Yeah, you heard me right. <laughs> you heard me right. It's the calling of the believer. I'll demonstrate this from the Bible. First Thessalonians, notice again what he says. Then when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone. By the way, notice the pastor's heart here, this shepherd Paul. He was so concerned. He really needed some a company, but he says, no, you leave me alone. I sent Timothy, our brother, our God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ, to establish and exhort you in the faith that no one be moved by these afflictions. He was so concerned about that. For you yourselves know... That we are, what does it say? We are destined for this. For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction just as it has come to pass and just as you know. By the way, do you remember the words of the Lord Jesus Christ? Jesus said this, these things I have spoken unto you, that in me, notice, you may have, what does he say? He says, I've spoken these things to you that you may have peace in the world. You will have. He didn't say you may have, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Why does he say that? Because I, the Son of God, has overcome the world, and that same Son of God lives within you this morning. My friends, how many of you know you're an overcomer? Say, I'm an overcomer. Amen and amen and amen, you are. So again, that's what the Bible tells us, but Jesus didn't say that we're going to have just kind of a little tiptoe, tiptoe through the tulips. What was that guy's name, Tiny Tim, who made... <laughs> Some of you are too young to know, too young to know Tiny Tim. He was, a, he was an exceptional ukulele player. But <laughs> and he made tiptoes to the... My friend, I just simply want to say to you that your faith in Christ, you can be, listen, deeply committed to Him. But it does not mean that you're not going to have some challenges in your life. Jesus also said this, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you are in the world, the world, notice... The world will love its own, but yet because you're not of the world. Did you realize you're not of this world, ladies and gentlemen, if you know Jesus? That is, you don't belong to this world. Notice, yet because you are not of this world, but I have chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the world, notice the word that I said unto you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute. What does he say? Now, I just want to say something. When you come to Christ, we had a very interesting discussion Wednesday night. By the way, if you don't come to Wednesday night, prayer, really it's a Bible study. We invite you to come. We will, you're going to eat before the study. 
you're going to get fried chicken. <laughs> and then you're going to get some Italian food every other week, possibly. And maybe some ribs, barbecue ribs. I'm not promising, but I, I'm, I'm, putting, I'm speaking that in faith. Some, some words, of, they, they may come. Okay. <clears throat> But we had a very interesting discussion this last Wednesday night, and I teach, and I'm on a little chair, and, and people interrupt me the whole time, don't they, Pam? I mean, they'll interrupt me, and they'll raise their hand, and I'll pastor, and it's, it was a kind of a question teaching time, and we have a good time doing that. But if you haven't come for that, you might just want to come and try it out, and uh, make sure you sign up for the meal, and, uh, and then come. But the meal starts around 5.30, but it's just a, just a different time. It's a good time. But we were, we were discussing this about it's very simple to make a decision for Jesus. What I mean, it's not complex. You don't have to be a theologian. I mean, you have to simply believe that Jesus went to the cross, died for your sins, was resurrected. He took your sin debt. That is, he paid on the cross through his body for your sin debt that you may be forgiven, and if you're willing to put your faith in Him, in Him alone, guess what? He'll cleanse you from every sin you've ever committed. I don't know how you can get any more simple than this. The Bible says, for whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be what? Do you remember when Paul and Silas were in jail and they were praising God and they had a little prayer meeting in jail? By the way, doesn't that just show you no matter where you are, you can have a praise time with God? I mean, then they are singing praises to God. About midnight, the prison doors opened up. And uh, the jailer is afraid that everybody's going to escape. But notice it says, Then he called for a light. He ran in, fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? <laughs> now, maybe he was thinking about physical death. You know, I, I don't know. But notice what he says, Believe. Believe, trust, put your faith. Notice, in who? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be, you shall be saved. You and your household if you believe. So, listen to me very carefully. Receiving Christ is very simple, but do not confuse simplicity with not making a very deep, profound commitment in your life. I'm going to show you this. Now, I want to show you a couple of scriptures here that you really need to listen to because, again, even though God has gone to the extreme, made it very easy, He says, if you'll just simply believe, you believe in my Son, you turn from your sins, you believe in my Son, and you put all your faith, all your trust in Him alone to get you to heaven, you're forgiven of every sin because you have believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. But don't, again, confuse simplicity with a deep commitment of your life. Jesus said this about those who follow him. Then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. How often? What does that mean? What does it mean, take up your cross? What did the cross mean to Jesus? It meant death, right to self. He is willing to die to self, go to the cross, die for you, die for me. Let him take up his cross, die to self daily, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whosoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does a man profit if he gains the whole world? Notice, and is himself destroyed or lost. For whosoever is ashamed of me and my words of him, the Son of Man, will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory." And in his fathers and the holy angels. So notice again what Jesus says. Even though it's very simple to give your life to Christ, listen to me, it's calling you to make a very deep, profound commitment of your life. Let me give you another thing that Jesus said. Notice, now great multitudes went with him. Well, let's see, we've got great multitudes here. Did Jesus say, well, let's see, we might lose some people if we're too tough and if our message is not politically correct or, you know, we, we may lose a little, folks, you know. There's great multitudes. Let's see what Jesus has to say to the multitudes that are here. And he turned and he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate, this word hate does not mean emotional hatred. It's a willingness to reject who does not reject his father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters. Yes, even his own life. You cannot be my disciple. 
And whoever comes who does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intended to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost? Notice what he's trying to say. If you're going to make a commitment to follow me, you need to count the cost because it is going to cost you something. See? Notice he says, lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man begin to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to make war against another king, does not sit down first and consider whether he is able to, with 10,000 to meet those who come against him with 20,000. Or else, while the other is a great ways off, he sends a delegation asking conditions of peace. So likewise... Whoever of you who does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. So what am I saying here? What is Jesus saying? He's saying this. It's very easy to give your life to Christ, but it does involve a commitment. You've got to repent of your sins and put your faith in Christ. You've got to deny yourself. Listen, every single day you deny I mean, you're going to have temptations in your life to get away from God, do this, do that, give into the flesh. No, my friend, you deny yourself every day of your life, and you make Jesus the Lord of your life every single day, even if that severs a relationship with the very ones you love. It's a commitment, very simple, but it's definitely a commitment. Thirdly, facing adversity is when we are vulnerable to the enemy's attacks. We're vulnerable during this time to the enemy's attacks. Notice, for this reason, I could not bear it any longer. I sent to learn of your faith and fear that the tempter, who is the tempter? Satan had tempted you and all of our labor would be in vain. Listen, did you know when you're going through a very deep down emotional time, you know, you're really depressed, you're going through a trial, you're going through adversity. How many of you know you're susceptible even more so to the enemy then? Because you start questioning and you start blaming God. Where is God in my life? I mean, this, this shouldn't be happening. He thought he loved me. thought I'm his child. thought he gave me the Holy Spirit. Why is this happening? I don't understand it. Then the enemy's going to come and say, you see, God doesn't love you. <laughs> you see, God's not watching over you like the Bible says. You see, God doesn't really care about your life or your family. And listen to me, your prayers aren't really effective. You pray and you pray and you pray. Hey, listen, th- those are mean- meaningless words. No, my friend. I can tell you the enemy's going to come. He's going to try to get you down even more so. Notice the Bible tells us in Corinthians, it says, But I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his what? How many of you know he's a crafty dude, right? I mean, <laughs> so your minds be corrupted from the simplicity that is in the gospel of Christ. Now, what are some of his tactics? Notice, now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, he said to the woman, has God really said? That's what he's saying. You see, he wants you to doubt the promises of the Word of God, the teaching of the Word of God. He doesn't want you to believe it. First thing, has God really said? You gotta be, no, no, he didn't say that, did he? Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, yeah, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, God said, no, you shall not eat it. You shall not touch it lest you die. But then the serpent said, oh, no, 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 no. You aren't going to die. As a matter of fact, you're going to become like God. Guys, I'm just trying to warn you in the midst of your adversity, don't you dare waver on the promises of the word of God. He will be faithful to you. So, you know, last week I sp- spoke on spiritual warfare. Here's, what I, here's the points I gave you. Don't, uh, don't underestimate the enemy. Expect opposition. Remember that point? 1 Thessalonians 3, 4, from when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand, notice, expect it. This is a surprise. Expect this. I said don't become passive. Don't become discouraged. Stay filled with the Holy Spirit. But let me give you a couple of little bullet points into this point. Guard your emotions. How many of you know your emotions can cause you to do very foolish things in your life? Guard what you allow your mind to dwell on. Am I right? Guard the places you go. You see, when you're going through very difficult times of trials in your life, you may go somewhere where you never thought you would go. 
Watch where you go. Also guard the people you allow in your life. Don't become isolated. I'm just so depressed and discouraged. Trials, I just feel so I'm not going to church. I'm going to stay home, stay home, stay home, stay home. Let me tell you what. I, I've known people who go in their houses and they close their curtains. I had a sister. She closed the curtains of her house every day. She didn't want to see any. Just, she wanted to be in the dark. Isolated herself. Well, you can imagine what happened. Down, 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 down. Listen, that's when the enemy tries to come in and he'll beat you down emotionally because he wants you to be isolated so he's the only one speaking into your life. And also pray daily that the Lord's going to give you strength. I can do all things through whom? Listen to me. If you have the power of the Spirit, Pentecost Sunday, the power of the Spirit in your life, my friend, you can get through everything in your life. But listen... Don't let your guard down on this guy right here. Notice the picture. He is described as a roaring lion seeking somebody, you, to devour, right? Don't let your guard down. Four, facing adversity is when we need encouragement from other people. I'm not going to read the whole passage of Scripture, but it says he sent Timothy. He sent Timothy is what he did. He, need, he knew they needed some strength. They needed teaching, biblical teaching. Listen to me. They needed sound doctrine. Needed encouragement. That's, that's why we don't, listen, that's why we don't need to be staying in our homes. Did you know the early church gathered together every week? Let me give you a verse of scripture that says this. Notice. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and the fellowship. The breaking of bread and prayers and fear came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together. They had all things in common, sold their possessions and their goods, divided them among them as anyone had a need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church, what does it say? Daily. Guys, again, I'm going back to isolation. Listen, God expects you to be in church on Sunday. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you're here. Let me give you a verse of Scripture. The Bible says, and let us not consider one another, uh, that is, let us consider one another, that is, in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking, what does he say? The assemblings of yourself together as the manner of some people are doing, undoubtedly, he said, but exhorting one another. Listen to this. So much as you see the day. Hey, are we in that day? So if you're listening online, God bless you. <laughs> God bless you. But, and we know that some of you could not be here on Sunday mornings. But if you can, you need to be because he expects you to be and you need to be for yourself, see? Okay. And then faithfulness to God's house is critical when you're going through adversity. Why? Because someone's going to encourage you. They're going to help you. They're going to pray for you. Man, we need each other. Man, I can't tell you how many times somebody comes up to me and just says a little word and of encouragement to me and, man, my spirits are lifted. You know, how many times have you, didn't, you didn't want to come to church? Maybe, maybe some of you right this morning, you're sitting right here and said, you know, I really didn't want to go to church today. But now that I'm here, I, I enjoy church, and I, I, I've been blessed, and I'm, I'm being lifted up. You see, you, you need to go to church. Faithfulness to God's house can make all the difference in your life and in your personal strength. That's why we encourage you to go to Sunday school. We need each other, okay? We need relationships. If all you do is come to church like this, who do you know? But now, I will say, though, I had someone in my, who has interested in membership this morning. She already knows eight to ten people. I know her name's Nancy. Her name's Nancy. This is her second time here. Raise your hand, Nancy. Oh, there she is right there. She says, I can't believe this church. I've been here just, this is my second time. I know eight to ten people. I know what they do already. I said, Whoa. But you need to get connected because you need somebody. What happens if you're in an accident, automobile accident during the weekend? You know, you come to church and someone says, hey, you know, all of a sudden two months goes down the road. Where's such and such at? You see, when you get connected with others, we encourage accountability and they reach out to you if you're not there. So 
We just need each other because isolation is like the Dead Sea. Notice this. Notice this. The Dead Sea. You know what? Why do they call it the Dead Sea? There's no outflow. Everything goes. There's not a living creature in that Dead Sea. It's called, it's called the Salt Sea also. I've not been there, but I understand if you sit on your back, you can float. Is that correct? Did you do that, Pam? Yeah. Just, you float. But there's, there's, it's dead. It's isolated. Right there at the end, no inflow. My friend, you need inflow into your life. You need people to speak into your life. You need to hear testimonies being spoken about the goodness and the mercy of God in your life realizing that you can get through this. So again, so very critical. I was going to give you some other scriptures. Let me just give you one. Uh, this, let me give you 2 Peter 3.18. But grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. He, growth is expected. Listen, growth is expected. You're not to be stagnant in your life like the Dead Sea. You're to be growing. Grow. And by the way, growth is normal, isn't it? Growth is normal. You know, if you're, if you're a little two-year-old, stay a two-year-old all the time, you say something's not quite right. Growth builds wisdom, strength, and stability in your life. And then lastly, one last point. Notice, it, uh, I, notice this point here. Did I give you all the points, Pam, did I? Did I cover them all? I'm sorry. Let me give you, okay, I'm sorry. Five is facing adversity is a time to go deeper in your faith. I know that I'm running late, so I'm trying to be careful here. Number five is facing adversity it means going deeper in your faith. I won't read the whole text, but if you look at the very end there, Paul says, I want to add what is lacking in your faith. So we need to go deeper in our faith, even in that time of adversity. Again, you're either going to, listen, you're going to run from God or you're going to run to God in the midst of adversity, okay? And so you want to be running to God. Ephesians 4, let's go back to that text, the very last part of that. Let's go there. Causes growth of the body of the edifying itself in love. So I, that, that point was growth. We need to grow. Not be stagnant, not be isolated. We need to grow. And then one last thing, number six. Yes, number six. Let me give you this one. Facing adversity causes us, notice what I say, to yearn for the Lord's return. Notice what he says here. Very interesting. The Bible says, this is what he says at the end of the chapter, chapter 3. Now, may the Lord God the Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another. There's going deeper there and growing for all, he says, as we do for you so that he may establish your hearts blameless in the holiness before the Lord our God and Father at the coming of the Lord Jesus with all his what? Oh, they're coming back with him. I think that's the rapture. We'll get into that later, but coming back with him. Why does he eventually go pretty deep into this. I want to, let me back up just a minute and I'll finish. I know I might have gone a little longer. Titus 2, 11, 13 calls the second coming the blessed hope. Now, why does he begin to mention this? And he goes through this, these two books. He really emphasizes the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Here's why he does it. Listen carefully. Because he wants us to know that what you're going through in the adversity of life is only temporary. Yes. It's not going to last forever. Can you say amen to that? <laughs> also, he talks about the second coming because we know what lies in the future. We know what lies in the future. So he wants to give them hope. And one last little sub-point. We know, listen carefully, at Christ's second coming, He's going to transform everything that is bad, evil, painful, hurtful, sorrowful, and we will never be touched with that again. Folks, we've got a reason to pray for the second coming of Christ. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come. Here's the question. Are you ready for the kingdom? Now, if you know Jesus... As your Lord and Savior, that doesn't mean you're, it may be mean you're ready from a salvation standpoint, but are we living for Christ? Is He number one in our life? Are we putting Him first in everything in our life? We're going to be here a very, very brief time. I don't want to be ugly about this, but 
he, you know, all of us aren't going to live that long. A hundred years. So let's say you make it to a hundred. You've got a brief time to live for Jesus. You say, I'm not willing to pay that kind of a cost, Pastor. That's too deep of a cost, my friend. What is, what is the worth of eternal life and forgiveness of your sins and an eternal home in heaven all through your life? My goodness, you would give all the money you had in the world for that. But here's the good news. It's free if you'll make a decision to follow Jesus. Would you stand with me as we pray? And I'm going to ask the elders and wise prayer teams to come forward. Father, I, I know that in a group this size, there's those who have been through very, very significant tragedy in their life. Lord, we know there's those who are going through some adversity in their life. Lord, we know this life has its troubles, but Father, I want to thank you. Lord, we can trust in you. We can believe your promises. Father, we know that you're going to be with us. And Lord, we know you're going to walk with us, Lord, through these times in our life. And Lord, we know that one day we're going to see Jesus. Lord, if there's anybody here today who's never given their life to Christ, Lord, you know who they are. And I pray today would be the day they settle it. They settle it. They mark it down. They turn from their sins and they make Jesus the very Lord of their life. They'll call upon you to be saved. Let this be that day. Lord, there may be others who need to recommit their life to Christ. They're not where they need to be. They may know the Lord. They may know you, Jesus, but they've allowed some interruptions in their life. They've allowed some things to come in that have no business being there, and you want them to recommit to you anew and afresh today in their life. Lord, there may be others who need prayer, encouragement from this body. Lord, they need someone to join them in prayer and pray for what they're going through in the midst of this adversity. Father, I just pray a hedge of protection around all of us today. And Father, we, we would be remiss if we did not pray for the nation of Israel today. Lord, they've asked the churches to pray for the nation of Israel. Lord, we know the adversity they're experiencing right now, this very second that I am speaking. And I pray a hedge of protection around them and their military and their leaders and give them a very speedy, decisive victory, Lord Jesus. Father, I just pray now that as we look to you, we need you. We need you every hour, every moment, every day. Holy Spirit, work right now for those who need a refilling of the Spirit. May they come in Jesus' name. Pastor Travis,